Questions are always encouraged. Please use the chat box. I will interrupt Michelle um, so she doesn't have to take a look and look at the chat box and uh, let her know if there's a question that fits in. We'll clean up all the other questions at the end. Um, but welcome, Michelle. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your knowledge and expertise. We're so excited to bring some potential uh, community scientists to you and link them up with these wonderful uh, projects and programs to help support, protect, conserve our monarch friends. Fantastic. Thank you, Bronwyn, so much. Um, let me see if I can get the screen share down here. Uh, all right, are you seeing the participant view or do I have it flipped again? Nope, we're good. Perfect, okay. Um, well, it's really nice to be with all of you this morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, so today uh, we're gonna talk some about basic monarch biology and ecology. And then as Bronwyn said, talk about five different monarch focused community science projects that you can do, um, depending on which ones are interesting to you. But as a starting point, I would like for you, if you are willing to put in the chat box, a rating for yourself on a scale of one to 10 about your familiarity with monarch biology and ecology. So on a scale of one to 10, where one is not at all familiar with the biology or ecology of monarchs, and 10 being expert level. So tell us where you're at with that. We got some experts here. Okay, we have lots of experts. We're high level folks and some beginners. And quite a few in the middle. Okay. That is awesome. So I, I am going to spend just some time talking about the basics of the monarch life cycle. Um, so for those who rated themselves as, you know, sevens and eights and nines and tens, that might be a little bit of review, but hopefully it's always good to um, jog our memories about these things. So um, uh, we'll <laughs> also, you know, it'll be of great benefit for those who are less familiar with that, um, those topics. Uh, before I want to, before I go any further, I want to make sure to acknowledge uh, a couple of sources. One is the Monarch Joint Venture, and the Monarch Joint Venture is a partnership of federal and state agencies, non-governmental organizations, businesses, academic programs at universities um, that are working together to protect monarch migration across um, the monarch range. They um. do. Yep. If, um, I turned five because when I was in pre K, I did a song about monarchs, and when I was in first grade, um, I did, I did, I raised monarchs, and I just all around love monarchs. That's awesome. Sounds like you have some experience, which is great. Um, very cool that you've had those experiences. So the Monarch Joint Venture um, is involved in conservation, in education, and in scientific research. And I wanted to mention it right up front because I think um, if you are looking for accurate research-based information on monarchs, Monarch Joint Venture is where I would recommend that you start. So there are just like many topics, um, there are all sorts of sources of information about monarchs to be found on the internet. And some of them are um, more reliable sources than others. Um, so I would really recommend that you check out Monarch Joint Venture for accurate and research-based information. And a lot of the slides that I'm using today came from Monarch Joint Venture. And some of them, if they weren't my own, came from Dr. Karen Uberhauser, who is my colleague at the University of Wisconsin. Um, the Monarch Joint Venture, just a couple of other mentions there, is um, they have monthly webinars 
um, about monarch conservation, and they also have some really great fact sheets that you can check out. Okay, so just starting um, at the beginning with the monarch life cycle, uh, monarchs, like other butterflies, uh, go through what is called metamorphosis, a changing of their, um, their shape and their look. Um, so from egg to adult, there are lots of different changes they go through that take place throughout their life cycle. And each, um, each stage has its own habitat requirements. The process of going from egg to caterpillar to chrysalis or pupa to adult butterfly takes about a month, but that is temperature dependent. So in colder weather, it can be um, slower than that. And um, when we talk about immature monarchs, we mean everything except for the adult butterfly. So eggs, caterpillars, pupa or chrysalis all are immature monarchs. And um, I don't have it written here, but I'll put in the chat box. The scientific name of monarchs is Danaeus plexippus. Okay, so monarchs start their life as an egg. And um, it's, a, it's good to learn how to recognize a monarch egg. They're not um, always that easy to see. They're about the size of the head of a pin. Um, and if you can get a look at them, especially with any through any sorts of um, magnifying glass, you will see these ridges that are going um, down lengthwise on the egg. And that can help you distinguish it as a monarch egg and not some other type of egg or a blob of milkweed sap. They also are sort of, um, they're not like completely round shaped, they're sort of pointy. Um, monarch eggs are most often laid on the underside of a milkweed leaf, the bottom of the leaf, um, but they can really be found on any part of it. So including on the flowers, the stem or the tops of the leaves. And the female monarchs lay on average about 500 eggs but not all on one plant. So then the egg, the caterpillar hatches out of the egg and is basically an eating machine. So a caterpillar's job um, is basically to eat and eat and eat and eat and grow. Um, and monarchs go through five different stages or called instars uh, is what we call them in, in um, insects. And those are the stages between each time that they molt, they shed their skin and they go into the next stage or instar. Um, so this picture here shows all five of the instars together along with an egg so that you can get a sense for how much uh, the monarch grows over time. So they grow in a, the roughly two weeks that they spend in the caterpillar stage, they grow 3,000 times what they were when they hatched. So when they go from the very first hatching out of their egg, like in this picture, to the fifth instar, the final stage that's getting close to pupating, they have grown 3,000 times their size. So just for a point of reference, if a second grader human did that, then she would be the size of a school bus at the end of two weeks. <laughs> um, so they really grow a tremendous amount. Um, let's see a couple of other interesting things here. When they hatch the um, caterpillar, the first thing it does, the uh, first thing it eats is it eats its eggshell, um, which is a great source of protein to get it started in its life. Um, and then, as I mentioned, they are eating and shedding their, uh, they're growing, but they can't, their, their skin, their exoskeleton on an insect can only get so big um, before they need to shed their skin and get to the next stage. Um, I see that there is a great question in the chat box about our caterpillars, um, is it dangerous to touch them? And you know, I do want to say that all kinds of different butterfly and moths 
moth caterpillars are different in that regard. So there are some caterpillars of different species that you can touch that will be stinging. Um, they have hairs on them that will sting you. Uh, monarchs are not that way. So it is um, safe to touch them. You, they don't have a poison that you can get from just touching them. Um, but it's always a good procedure to wash your hands after you've handled things like that. Okay, so there, this is a picture of the caterpillar shedding its skin. Oftentimes they'll turn around and eat that, eat part of or all of that skin that they have shed. And in that stage, you know, we talked about the habitat importance. Um, caterpillar, monarch caterpillars need milkweed plants because that is what they're eating to grow 3,000 times in size. Um, it are plants in um, the group called milkweeds. And in Maryland or in Virginia, they're about the same. There are around 15 different species of milkweeds. And some of them are much more common than others. Some of them are used more by monarchs than others. But um, that's basically the number of species of plants that monarchs can eat in the, in the caterpillar stage or the larval stage. Um, let's see. And on that topic, I see somebody asks if poke milkweed is native to Maryland. Um, and I would have to look that up. Um, I do not know off the top of my head and would also want to make sure of what um, this, the, the scientific name is, because of course, somebody might call one thing poke milkweed and it's a different species than what somebody else calls poke milkweed. Um, but pokeweed is a totally different plant that is not a milkweed, um, just to be clear on that. Okay, so the caterpillar has eaten a ton, it's gotten big, and then it, when it's ready to form a chrysalis, it crawls away from the milkweed, typically, away from the plant that it had been eating to find some sort of sheltered area. And then it spins a little silk button right here um, with the spinneret that is located beneath its jaws or mandibles. And once it's spun that little button, um, then it turns around and hangs upside down from the end of its abdomen for about 12 to 18 hours in this J form. Um, and then when it's ready, that larva molts one last time. So the skin is splitting um, at the back of its head or neck area. And then within about 30 seconds, it um, sheds, sheds that skin, molts, and then you see the shiny green pupa below. And it starts out soft, um, but in about 30 minutes, then the, um, it will harden up and kind of reshape into this uh, chrysalis look that is familiar to many people. Um, and it will, it, in, within about 24 hours, it will completely harden up. Um, so the, um, the, the chrysalis is the least easy stage to find out in nature, because if you're looking for eggs and caterpillars, they're gonna be on milkweed. So you can be looking on milkweed, but the chrysalis, the caterpillar will have crawled off and could go anywhere, maybe even like three meters away from a milkweed plant. And so, and they're cryptically colored. So under, unlike the bright yellow and black and white of the caterpillar, it's green in a world of green. So it's, um, it's really exciting to get to find them in nature, um, but much less common to, to get to see them just because they're harder to find. So after spending um, 10 to days to about two weeks in that stage, then you know that um, the caterpillar or the pupa is um, getting ready to turn into the adult butterfly when you see the coloration. So the pigment, the coloration is the last thing to form on the butterfly before it's ready to eclose or emerge from its pupa casing. Um, sometimes people think 
that in that green pupa, the monarch has turned to some sort of soup or goo. That is not true. Um, that is a myth. Um, they are actually just, you know, a, they are a, a, um, a formed creature in there. It's not just like a bunch of soup and then a new creature, you know, reforms out of it. Um, so it only takes about 30 seconds or so for um, the monarch to open up that pupil casing. Um, and as they come out, they look deformed um, at first, but that's because the wings are all crinkled up and the butterfly will pump um, hemolymph or butterfly blood basically from its abdomen out into its wings to expand the wings. And then um, kind of like the pupa, the butterfly is not hardened right away. It comes out soft. And so it, the butterfly will hang upside down for several hours to let its wings dry and harden into their final shape. So um, they're still um, more fragile for the first day or two after they eclose or come out of the chrysalis, but they can fly within um, four or five hours. So this is a video of um, that process in action. A time lapse video, I should say. Okay, there were lots of questions at the beginning about male and female monarchs and what each of them look like. So um, let's use the chat box again and have people say whether they think the monarch on the left is a male or a female. So type in the chat box if you think. All right. So far, most people have said female. One person has guessed male. OK, so actually. Yes, the one on the left is the female and the one on the right is the male. So um, if you look for some differences here, you'll notice that the male has these spots on their hind wings. They're like little raised black patches. They're called androconial patches. And in monarchs, they don't serve any purpose other than they make it easier for us to distinguish males and females. But in some other species of butterflies, they are um, cells that produce and release pheromones, but they don't do that in monarchs. Um, some other differences to notice are that females have thicker veins. The black lines, the veins on the wings are thicker than in the male. So that sort of gives the female an overall appearance of being a little duller in color because the black is thicker and the orange is um, less thick. And the orange that they have is a little bit duller in color as well. And then kind of the fail safe way to tell the difference between males and females in monarchs is if you actually have them in your hand, you can look at the tip of the abdomen and I don't have a picture of this, but the male has claspers on the end of the abdomen, so little um, protrusions, and the female has a little V-shaped notch on the end of the abdomen. Um, so, okay, we've made it all the way around from egg to larva to pupa to adult. And- um, Michelle, Michelle yeah. Bronwyn, two things. One, Jeff had a question, just what what is the, I guess, the um, advantage or benefit of having a metamorphic lifestyle um, for an insect, like a um, like a butterfly that has to go through these different 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 phases of, of, of life. Yeah, that's probably there are probably lots of answers to that question. I'll offer one, which is um, animals that go through metamorphosis 
get to use different habitats. So like the their um, juvenile or larval stage can use different food sources and different habitats than the adult stage. So that's definitely true um, in monarchs because they're eating plants um, in the larval stage. They're actually like eating the leaves of the milkweed and the adult stage is gathering nectar from flowers. So they're you, you know, able to um, use different food sources. And the same thing is true for like tadpoles and adult frogs that they can use different habitats and different food sources. So that's, um, that's one reason. And I'm sure there are others as well. Um, and monarchs are not, the kinds of things I have said so far about the monarch life cycle are not unique. Um, so most butterflies are going to have, maybe all butterflies are going to have a pretty similar life cycle. The actual length of time spent in any one of those stages might differ among um, different species. What they look like, of course, differs, but they, butterflies generally go through egg, pupa, or egg, larva, pupa, adult stages. Um, okay. So um, adults in the non-migratory monarch uh, uh, generations will live for a few weeks. So maybe up to a month. Um, and they, um, during that time they mate and the female lays eggs and they eat nectar from flowers. Those are like the main things that adult monarchs do. Um, so both the male and the female have to eat nectar from flowers. Um, they're not specialists on any particular type of flower. So even though their caterpillars can only eat milkweeds, the adult butterfly is um, much more of a generalist and can gather nectar from lots of different kinds of flowers. Um, but they do need flowering plants to survive. But what is unique about monarchs, so I said so far the things I've said are not that different than any other butterfly. What is so special and interesting and unusual about monarchs, as you probably already know, is their long distance migration. And um, every insect that lives in a cold, um, a cold climate like Maryland or Virginia where it freezes, and their food source dies. So these are milkweed plants that are senescing and then you know dead in the winter. So there's nothing for monarchs to eat um, in Maryland or in Virginia in the winter time. And different animals di deal with that in different ways. So some types of insects um, might overwinter in that place by like crawling into a little crevice or um, Maybe they overwinter in the egg stage, for example. But monarchs' strategy for dealing with winter is instead to leave. So they um, fly away to a better climate um, where they can spend the winter. And it's really quite amazing. So um, the monarch migration is one of the largest animal migrations in the whole world. They fly from the US and Southern Canada all the way to central Mexico every fall. So for some butterflies that might be a, um, traveling up to 3000 miles. The monarchs that are west of the Rocky Mountains migrate to the coast of California. So they don't go as far, but they do still migrate. Um, this graphic shows how um, it shows you kind of the date here at the top and then you can follow along and see migration begins in September and that monarchs have usually reached the overwintering win sites by November 1st. So um, that is in conjunction with the Day of the Dead or the Dia de los Muertos in Mexico. So there are a lot of cultural um, practices 
in Mexico where you see monarch butterflies appearing as part of the Day of the Dead, which is really cool. Um, so these monarchs that are doing the migrating live much longer than the other generations of monarchs, which I said the adult butterfly lives two to four weeks. These monarchs that are migrating live seven to nine months. So they are, you know, migrating in September, maybe all the way to the overwintering sites in um, South Central Mexico and living all winter and then migrating not all the way back up north um, in the spring, but to the southern United States in the spring. So they are living um, a much longer time. And the, there, here are some pictures of where they go in Mexico. Um, the Oyamel fir forest, so it's a high elevation um, evergreen forest. And it's a really small area. So this shows you a scale of 20 miles here. And this red orange box um, outlines the whole area where monarchs go in Mexico. So it's just like absolutely stunning to think about monarchs across this huge geographic area here, all concentrating down to this tiny geographic area in Mexico. And that's one of the reasons why they're so vulnerable from a conservation standpoint. Um, these are, you can see the orange looking trees, that's the monarchs all spending the winter um, hanging on the trees. To look at that more closely, here are pictures of the monarchs forming these clusters hanging on the branches and covering the trunks of the trees. Um, in the late winter, they become more active and start flying around um, in the overwintering sites. They start mating again and they begin their journey back to their breeding grounds where there's milkweed. Um, leave, they leave um, around mid-March, um, late February, mid-March from Mexico, um, making their way north. And this graphic shows um, their arrival in different parts of the United States. So they're basically following the milkweed. When, as the milkweed appears, then they are laying eggs on that milkweed. And those subsequent generations are colonizing further and further north. Um, and the patterns of when monarchs are in different places within their breeding range um, depends on, on weather. So, you know, in the middle of the hot summer, um, monarchs are not typically found in places like Texas or really far south in the United States because um, it's become too hot and dry for both the monarchs and their milkweed host plants. Um, the Midwestern United States is um, where the highest population, summer populations of monarchs are. Um, and then Again, that last generation that is, emerges as adult butterflies in around September are the ones that are gonna make that migration southward. And those monarchs have never been to Mexico before. They don't have, like, it wasn't even their parents that went to Mexico. It was like several generations before that were the butterflies that traveled to Mexico. And yet they find their way to the same places um, in those, high elevation mountains every year, which is just, it's an amazing natural history phenomenon. Hey, Michelle, it's Bronwyn. Yeah. Melissa wanted to know um, the, the cold snap that happened in the South recently, did that have an impact on uh, uh, monarch populations? I don't know, but I think that that um, hit, Texas before the monarchs would have gotten there. But I don't know, I'm not sure I've seen any report yet and it, it might there might be information out there and I just haven't looked for it or seen it about whether like milkweed had started coming up and maybe it got killed back by the frost. I haven't seen anything about that. Okay. 
Okay, so we've kind of covered the monarch life cycle. In the fall, they're feeding on nectaring. They're starting to group up, migrating to Mexico where they hang out in high, high concentrations. And then in the spring, they're um, leaving Mexico, coming back to their breeding grounds where they find milk, young milkweed plants to lay their eggs on, and then they go through the typical butterfly life cycle for a few generations in the areas where they're breeding. So, okay, so to go back to Melissa's question more generally, like what's happening with monarch populations, um, the best time to count monarchs is in the winter because they are all in this concentrated place, at least our Eastern monarchs, not the ones that go to California. Um, so the, the, these oyamel fir trees that host the colonies of monarchs are often called butterfly trees. And scientists go out every year and mark the butterfly trees around the perimeter of you know, the area that the monarchs are covering and they measure the distance between those marked trees and they record the time and the date and they use mapping software to basically compute the surface area of each colony of monarchs. Um, and they give that in hectares. And just for reference, a hectare is equal to about two and a half acres um, or is about the size of two and a half football fields. So, and then science, if you're trying to think about like, well, what does a hectare of butterflies mean in terms of numbers, scientists use an estimate of 10 to 50 million individual butterflies per hectare. So it's by counting the monarch population in the winter time that we know that monarchs are declining and that the migration, that awesome migration is um, in jeopardy. Can you say again about they measure in between the trees? Yeah, so basically like they, they thanks for that question. They are looking at like this big patch where butterflies are concentrated and they're marking the edges of it, the edge trees where the butterflies are. Imagine like making a, like marking a circle in that way and then they're calculating how big is that area. And you had said something about them, they counted the actual trees too, or? Oh, no, they they just, um, I don't think they count the different, the number of trees necessarily, okay. just that they mark them. Yeah. Okay. To, All right, thanks so much. Yeah, no, thanks for that good question. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, okay, so this, graph is the results of that process that we just talked about. So here on the bottom, you can see the year and it, you know, because it crosses over years because the monarchs get there in November and stay till February or March, it has two years. So like the winter of 94, 95, 95, 96, et cetera. And then hectares is here on the vertical um, and then remember that each hectare, one hectare is about the size of two and a half football fields. So it goes up and down every year. Monarch populations absolutely go up and down every year for all kinds of reasons, but there is, it has been an overall decline in monarch populations based on the total area that their colonies occupy at the overwintering sites in Mexico. Um, and with the, the lowest low so far being the winter of 2013-2014, um, when the monarchs took up a space of less than two football fields. So all the monarchs that are going to be recolonizing their breeding grounds in the spring fit into a space less than two football fields that year. Um, they, the population came up some since then, um, but is still overall um, much lower than it was 
um, 10 or 20 years ago. And just on February 25th, so not very long ago, the numbers for this year were announced. So the scientists finished their calculations. Um, they located nine different overwintering colonies in Mexico with a total of 2.1 hectares in size. So that was a 25% roughly decrease from the previous year, which also was not a great year for monarchs. So that's, that's not great news. Um, okay. So why? Um, and I saw people asked about disease and I know somebody asked about um, some weather questions. So what is going on? There are a few different things that are contributing to the decline of monarchs and climate change is a challenge. Um, you know, many different things, but I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about each one of them. So some monarchs get sick, they get diseases or they get eaten by predators. And that's a, um, you know, a natural thing to have happen. Um, weather can be a big bummer. So even like aside from climate change, just natural weather, bad luck with weather can, um, can have a negative impact on monarchs in any given year. So, you know, uh, lots of rain during the time that they would be breeding in Texas or a really bad cold snap in at their overwintering sites can have pretty big effects. Um, use of pesticides um, is certainly a hot topic and is something that is Im likely impacting monarchs in their breeding area. And also just general habitat loss. So um, loss of habitat, both in their breeding area and their overwintering area. And I think I have some more information about that. Um, okay, so first of all, talking about natural causes, um, diseases, for example, they have um, a variety of parasites that affect them. Um, one is a tachinid fly, it's a type of fly that um, lays eggs in the larvae and then the larvae, the fly larvae, so the fly has its own complete metamorphosis. The larvae of the fly basically eat the caterpillar from the inside out. Um, and then instead of getting a monarch butterfly coming out of a chrysalis, you get fly pupae, fly larvae coming out and pupating. Um, and that, and the monarch is left dead. Uh, monarchs also are susceptible to some bacterial and viral illnesses as well. Um, weather, so monarchs can't fly around if it's too cold. Um, they will die if they're in a place where temperatures get too much below freezing. So a harsh winter in Mexico can be bad thing, mean bad things for a population that's small. Um, Climate change is a threat because that is changing um, the rainfall patterns, changing um, temperature patterns. Um, and so monarchs might, might be more likely to encounter um, weather related natural disasters, basically. And predators are also a natural cause of death. Um, birds eat them. Um, most birds would get sick if they eat um, monarchs because they are um, toxic for vertebrates eating them. But there are some birds in Mexico that are adapted um, and are immune to the toxins. They have learned to eat just the abdomen of the butterfly, which is, has the lowest concentration of toxins. Um, and then there are other kinds of predators more commonly, um, insects and spiders and other invertebrates that eat monarchs at all kinds of life stages. Um, and those toxins that monarchs have in them are much less effective on invertebrate predators. Um, pesticides. So um, if you have um, plants that have um, in Systemic insecticides, neonicotinoids are ones that people have um, maybe heard about. 
these are things that make the whole plant um, toxic to, you know, every part of the plant is toxic to um, insects. Um, so if you're, you know, concerned about that, you want to think about where to get your plants from. Um, do some research, ask what chemicals are used um, in the growing of the plants at your local nursery or place that you get, um, that you get plants. Um, and I see somebody has a question about milkweed plants and milkweed weevils. And I do not know the answer of which ones are less susceptible to milkweed weevil infestation. Um, I, yeah, I've not ever, I, I am familiar with milkweed weevils, but I'm not familiar with any types of milkweeds that are more or less susceptible to those. So good question. I don't know the answer to it. Um, okay, and then habitat loss is the other big one. So um, loss of breeding habitat. So as um, fields that have milkweed um, are converted to developed areas in the breeding grounds, then that takes away milkweed habitat. Um, and also logging in the overwintering grounds um, is there are restrictions on that, but it happens still illegally. Um, and that impacts, uh, that thinning of the forest impacts monarchs because the forest acts as both a blanket and an umbrella for them. So it protects them from rain and snow, the umbrella part, and it helps keep them um, the right temperature, like a blanket over the winter. Um, so as when the forest is thin, thinned out or there isn't the forest there at all for them, then they don't have that um, protective umbrella and blanket. You maybe saw the news about um, the monarch butterfly um, ruling relating to the Endangered Species Act um, that just came out um, pretty recently. So basically the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, has determined that putting the monarch butterfly on the list of threatened and endangered species for the US is um, warranted. So it, it, it is, deemed in need of that, but they can't list it yet because they are working on higher priority listing um, species. So basically it's a candidate for being listed um, as a threatened or endangered species and its status will get reviewed every year until it is no longer a candidate. Okay. The whole rest of the time, I wanna share with you those five different citizen science projects that you can do. But why don't we just stop for a second and I'll see if I can catch up on any questions about basic monarch, butter, monarch biology or ecology that have come in. So Bronwyn, are there any ones you want me to particularly address? No, I think what we've covered every, all of oh, us uh, awesome. going on. So I think we can move on. That is awesome. Okay, great. Um, so what can you do? There are lots of things you can do in terms of monarch conservation, but because of the focus of today, we're going to focus on community science, citizen science, things that you can do. Um, and there are five different ones that would all be open to you in Maryland. And monarchs, another thing that is so cool and unique about them is that um, community science has been a part of monarchs for a really long time, starting in 1952, when Dr. Fred Urquhart um, began this program called the Insect Migration Association. Because in 1952, scientists did not know that monarchs were migrating to Mexico. In general, people in the US did not know what was happening to monarchs in the winter. Of course, people who live in that area of Mexico knew that the monarchs arrived, in November, but they didn't necessarily know where they were coming from. So um, Dr. Urquhart started a tagging program where he involved all kinds of people in tagging monarch butterflies and looking for the tags. Um, and it was two 
community scientists, just like you all, who discovered, um, who, who found tagged butterflies allowing for um, the discovery of those overwintering sites by scientists, people local to Mexico knew they were there. Um, that, and that was a huge discovery. Um, and since that point, there have been so many different uh, monarch community science projects. Um, and since in the last 20 years, two thirds of scientific research papers that uh, focused on monarchs outside of the overwintering colonies, um, because only scientists with permits are allowed to do research there. But two thirds of the other kinds of research studies on monarchs used community science data. So it's really pretty important. Um, so why would we involve people, you know, all kinds of people in monitoring monarchs? Their huge spatial and temporal range means that volunteer contributions are really needed to answer a lot of questions. Um, and it allows us to take a variety of approaches to research. And um, it also engages lots of different people in conservation of monarchs too. Um, so, okay, project number one that you can do right now um, is called Journey North. And that is a project where you report casual observations of monarchs each season. And they use them to basically study the, the seasonal patterns, the phenology of monarchs in both the spring and the fall. And that's demonstrated here by this cool map where you can see um, a graphic of when the first monarch butterfly adult is sighted um, across the, the United States. And so you can see that um, in whatever year this was, looks like it was around mid to late April that they were first observed in um, Maryland. Oh, maybe there was even one in, in March, it looked like. So this is a really easy project to participate in. You basically can report any of these things in different seasons. So in the spring, you can report the first monarch you see, monarch adult, the first milkweed you see coming up, the first monarch egg that you observe, and the first monarch caterpillar that you observe. Um, in the summertime, you can report the first monarch that you see in summer, any additional ones you see, eggs and caterpillars. And in the fall, it's the other big kind of seasonal time, um, you report monarch um, roosts. If you see monarchs grouping together, um, peak migration, like the day that you see the most butterflies flying overhead. Um, and you can also still report monarch eggs and caterpillars in the fall. So these are like pretty casual observations. There it doesn't have to be like a set site that you monitor, or it doesn't have to be done at the exact, exact certain time. Um, so it's a really easy way to participate. Um, but the things you need to be able to do are recognize adult monarch butterflies. If you want to be able to report milkweed, you would need to be able to recognize what milkweed looks like recognizing monarch eggs and caterpillars, and then you just need to be able to report data online using a really simple form. So um, if you can do, if you at the very least can just recognize adult monarch butterflies and report data, then you can participate in this project. Hey, Michelle. Yeah. Two questions. One, where do we get that? Where could somebody get that graphic if they wanted to use it? The one with the with the um, showing the uh, the map. The map. Yep. If you go to Journey North, you can get you can look up um, these data and graphics for um, monarchs, and they also have a lot of other. We're only talking about monarchs today, but they have a lot of other. Um, phenology studies that they do of different species, and you can get information on those as well. But you can get graphs for spring emergence of milkweed, first monarch observed in the spring, peak migration in the fall, all that stuff, um, maps of that at journeynorth.org. 
And then Calvin wants to clarify, um, are these for wild monarchs only or what if they're rearing monarchs? Do we count those? Yeah, no, you, this would be for wild monarchs. Yeah. Okay, so that's Journey North, great entry point. If you are interested in um, getting a little more involved with monarch ecology and the diseases that affect them, there is a project called Project Monarch Health. And that one involves testing monarchs for this parasite that occurs on them, uh, a naturally occurring parasite with a really long name called Ophriocystis electroscura, but we call it OE for short. And this is a protozoan parasite that um, is transmitted when the adult butterfly scatters the spores of this parasite on eggs and milkweed. And then the larva inadvertently eats the spores from this protozoan parasite um, and it reproduces um, within the caterpillar and the life cycle of it goes on. And it, um, a butterfly that has a really low level of this parasite, you might not see any differences. Butterflies that are really highly infected might actually be even too weak to fly or be kind of deformed. Um, so there's a big range, but there is some really interesting ecological research going on relating to um, where you see higher rates of this parasite and impacts that it can have on monarch migration and how different conservation uh, or how different uh, milkweed growing practices might affect it as well. Um, this is just a graph of a uh, map showing um, the infection prevalence of this OE. Um, and I kind of zoomed in on the, the Maryland area there. So you can see people who were testing for this found anywhere from zero to in Maryland looks like maybe the highest was more than 50% um, infected with this OE parasite. Um, so for this one, you need to be able to recognize and capture monarch adults. Um, so you'd have to net monarch adult butterflies so that you can test them for this parasite or to um, capture wild monarch caterpillars and safely rear them inside um, without introducing any additional disease in order to then test the adults. You can't test them for this parasite until they're adults. Um, you would need to be able to handle adult butterflies in order to get the sample, which they, they'll send you a kit. And it basically involves sticking a piece of tape on the butterfly's abdomen and then sticking the tape to a card so that it can be looked at under a microscope. Um, if you are doing this project, or if you are ever doing any sort of monarch rearing, and I will come back to that question, um, it's really important to keep everything clean of disease using something like bleach, um, because otherwise you might be introducing additional disease into your monarch population. So to sign up for that one, monarchparasites.org, Project Monarch Health. Okay, third fun project that you can do is Monarch Watch. And that is the one that is basically the current form of that project that Dr. Fred Urquhart started all the way back in 1952, where um, we are tagging butterflies to look for, um, to get more information about their migration. And so by tagging butterflies in one place and finding them in another place, we can learn more about um, where and when the migration is taking place. Um, so for this project, see the tag that we put on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, for this project, you basically um, put little tiny stickers on the butterfly um, and it says who to call if somebody finds that sticker. And it's a really fun project to do um, with groups in the fall. 
Um, so to do that one, you need to be able to recognize and capture monarch adults. You have to buy the tags. They're not very expensive, but you do have to purchase the tags through Monarch Watch. And you need to be comfortable handling the adult butterflies to put the tags on and reporting your data online. So also pretty, pretty basic stuff. Um, and the way you look for information on that project is at monarchwatch.org. And they also have a lot of good other information about monarch biology. Um, okay, so the next one, we've talked about three so far. So we've got two more and they're kind of similar. Um, one is called the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. And this is a project to study monarch populations during their breeding season. So it's not focused on um, their migration, like Journey North or Monarch Watches. It is focused on the time that they're breeding, laying eggs and um, on milkweed and caterpillars eating milkweed. And the basic concept with this project is that you choose a milkweed site, a place with milkweed growing, and you go there regularly and count the number of monarch eggs and caterpillars that you find. There are some other pieces of this project too that you can do as kind of add-ons, but that's the most basic um, form of it. And your site might be your backyard if you have milkweed there or a garden or a park or a roadside that you find milkweed growing or a prairie. If it is not your own property, you should make sure you have permission to do this work there before you do it, I will say. Um, but the site size and place can vary. Um, how much milkweed you have there can vary. Um, once a year, you would fill out information on just like a basic description of the site. And then there are things that you would do weekly um, in terms of counting the monarch egg, looking at all the milkweed plants or a sample of the milkweed plants very carefully and counting the number of eggs and caterpillars that you find. Um, and there are some other, like I said, additional things you can do where you're measuring the milkweed quality, tracking precipitation and estimating parasitism rates. Those are kind of side, side add-ons. This is a map of all the MLMP, Monarch Larva Monitoring Project sites. Um, so you can see there's quite a few people who have done this in the uh, Northern Virginia and uh, Maryland area. But I think we always can use more information to understand monarch um, breeding populations. So there's absolutely room for more participation in this project. And you can, um, use the data from these projects to get an understanding of when monarchs are in different life stages where you are. So this is just data from 2019, summarized for Maryland um, that I picked out. There were seven sites monitored in Maryland that year. And on average, they looked at 300 plants a week. And you can see that kind of the peak time that they found monarch eggs and caterpillars was in August and early September. And this, I'll just say a side note here, in addition to actually participating in these projects, um, all of them, Journey North with those cool maps, um, Project Monarch Health, Monarch Watch, this MLMP, um, they all have their data, the results available online. So they're really good sources to look for, for actual data on monarch um, populations. So to do this particular project, I'll share like I have with the other ones, you need access to a site with milkweed. You need to be able to recognize the milkweed species. So if you are monitoring the wrong kind of plant, like you thought it was a milkweed and it actually wasn't, then you're never gonna find monarchs. Um, so you wanna make sure that you know how to recognize milkweed accurately. And you need to be able to recognize the monarch eggs and the five different larval in stars. Um, and it's best if you can do the monitoring once a week. So you would be um, typing in or you would be um, going out and 
looking for the eggs and caterpillars on the milkweed on a weekly basis. And then like other projects, you report the data online. And the website for that one is mlmp.org. And as Bronwyn said, this recording will be available so you can go back um, and get the links to these different projects. Um, but you can also find them all by going to that joint venture, Monarch Joint Venture website that I showed at the beginning, and they have all of those Monarch citizen science projects collected there. And then the very last project to mention is the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program, or IMMP, and it is similar to the monarch larva monitoring project in that it is focused on the monarch breeding habitat and breeding season. Um, but this of all of the projects is the most scientifically rigorous. So if your big motivation is to have like a important impact on science, then this might be one you wanna take a look at because it's the most, um, scientifically rigorous one, because what they have done is um, identified random sampling sites um, for potential monarch habitat. And then people are choosing places to monitor within those areas, um, making it the results a little bit more um, meaningful versus the monarch larva monitoring project where people are just picking wherever they want to go. So there might be biases um, introduced that way. So um, for this one, you need to be, it's the skills are really similar. So you need access to a site with milkweed um, and they will help you um, with, if you want to have one within those priority blocks. Um, you need to be able to recognize milkweed species and other blooming plants, recognize monarch eggs and caterpillars. You'll still have to describe some basic characteristics of your site. And then the exact monitoring that you do could be weekly to monthly, depending on which activities you're doing. And like all the other ones, you were reporting your data online. So that was like a whole bunch of different um, projects, but it looks like we do have some time to answer questions about any one of them. And then I also will come back and talk a little bit about rearing of monarchs because I said I would. But before I do that, let me just catch up and see if there are other questions that I should answer about any of these projects. Does anybody have any particular questions about the community science project that Michelle shared with us? Kimberly says, is there a site to help in Cape May, New Jersey? There is. So there is a specific project in at Cape May where they are um, monitoring monarchs during the fall migration. Um, and that one is listed on the joint venture page as well. Um, the ones with the larva watch, I just have a question. Um, can you can these be done in your backyard with milkweed that you've planted or does it have to be in, in wild areas that you find the milkweed? Yeah, so the, the monarch larva monitoring project can definitely be done um, in your backyard with planted milkweed. Um, and they'll have a place to indicate that you're using a garden versus a natural area. Um, Turn the microwave! Um, I have a quick question about the um, the yeah. last one, the Monarch, you know, the IMMP. Yeah. You said that they they have ID'd random sampling sites. So they, do they assign you a site? So I think what you I think what you would do is I think that they will assign you an area that is like bigger than a site, and okay. that you would find a site within that area um, that seems appropriate, but definitely like co contact them and look at their, um, oh, I forgot to include the website for them, didn't I? Um, it's, it's on the joint venture one actually. Um, so the, contact them to be sure of the exact process on that. Um, but I think that that's how it works. 
but uh, just so I understand, they don't, it doesn't currently have milkweed. And so interestingly for this project, um, you might end up monitoring a site that doesn't have milkweed. <laughs> Okay. Um, and so, of course, then you're not going to find any monarch eggs or caterpillars there, okay. but they do have you record other aspects of the habitat, like blooming flowers. Um, okay. And, you know, it will still contribute to like an overall understanding of where there is monarch habitat and where there isn't and where monarchs are and where they aren't. Got it. Thanks so much. So, okay, I'm going to come back to the question about um, that somebody asked at the very beginning about, um, and I actually want to word it the same way that this person did. So I'm going to go um, all the way. Michelle, there was a question about, uh, I mean, I, maybe you're going to get to that in the rearing um, about uh, how to clean netted monarch cages with bleach, ratio of bleach to water process. Oh yeah. Um, is that? Yeah, I okay. I will. I'll come to that. Um, let's see. All right. Well, I can't find the original question, but basically, somebody asked, like, "Am I helping by rescuing monarchs out of the wild and rearing them in captivity?" And I'm gonna say no. Um, and sometimes people don't really like that answer, <laughs> but here's the truth. Um, rearing monarchs is absolutely fine from a perspective of you're interested in getting to observe them more closely, or you're wanting to use them as like a demonstration or for educational purposes, um, or maybe you're doing it for one of these specific research projects. But just doing it as a conservation strategy, like to help monarchs, is actually not effective. So if you look at you know, any of the, there is a, a monarch conservation plan, like there is for many kinds of species. There is an actual conservation plan. You can find it from Monarch Joint Venture. Um, and individual captive breeding of monarchs is not a conservation strategy. Um, because what monarchs really need is habitat, um, being their outdoor natural habitat, and um, to be able to have access to milkweed, to flowers growing outside, and to be part of the natural ecosystem, not to be taken out of the natural ecosystem um, in terms of a broader conservation strategy. So you know, by bringing a monarch that you find outside, inside, you might protect that individual monarch from being eaten by a predator, but you have kept it from being part of its natural ecosystem, um, which has a lot of other pieces to it that are important as well. Um, so again, like I rear monarchs sometimes, I'm not at all saying to people like never rear monarchs um, because I might do it for, um, observational purposes, like, oh, I just want a chance to get to watch them more closely, or I might do it because I um, want to use them for an educational program or something like that. Um, but I wouldn't try to collect all the monarchs that you find in order, like with the thought that you are contributing to the conservation of the species, um, is my answer on that. If you are rearing monarchs for whichever um, purpose, um, it is important to do it in a way, a, as safe a way as possible for the monarchs. And um, somebody asked about like the bleaching of en enclosures and that kind of thing. Um, and I'm going to refer you to the, the Monarch Joint Venture has a fact sheet about rearing monarchs. That would be a good place to check for the um, proper cleaning procedures and ratios. I'm, I'm trying to remember the bleach solution percentage. I want to say it's like a 20% bleach solution. Um, but I would double check that myself, um, before, before going with that number. Um, 
And there's also recommendations about um, like outside or inside. So if you're rearing monarchs, you know, even for educational purposes, the more you can keep it um, exposed to natural um, sunlight and temperatures, uh, the better in terms of, especially if you're gonna be releasing those monarchs later. Um, there are some, are there are a couple of really good webinars. I know I keep harping on joint venture, but they're just such a really good source of information. Um, and I can't give all the information from, from them in this talk, but they had a couple of really good webinars about um, rearing monarchs that I recommend you find on their website and, and go back and, and watch if this is something that's of interest to you. Um, and they can give you the latest research on, um, you know, how monarchs that are reared in captivity are different than wild caught ones and, and that kind of thing. Um, awesome. Okay, so let's see, what other questions do we have? Oh, you're muted, Bronwyn. Now I'm muted. <laughs> it is true that um, in Mexico, they kill off population with pesticides or they're dying from climate change. I think the biggest impact to the monarchs in Mexico is the loss of habitat. So that they are, um, as the forests are, trees are removed from the forest through illegal logging or even subsistence logging, um, then that is impacting the availability of that winter habitat for monarchs. But climate change is also a factor where there are, in a less specific way, but um, as maybe you know, climate change um, affects different places differently. And in some places, it um, is causing um, more frequent um, natural disaster events, like more frequent um, flooding or more frequent ice storms and things like that. Um, and so that could certainly have an impact. And then also the two things relate between climate change and habitat because um, those fir, OML fir forests grow on high elevation mountaintops. Um, and if the climate really warms there, those sites over a longer time period may no, may, may no longer be a good spot for those that type of tree to live. Um, so that might impact monarchs overwintering sites as well. Calvin? Yeah, thanks. I have a question about, so there was a study a little while back about how reared monarchs don't have as successful migration, but it was like just a very small study. And, and I'm just wondering um, if you have any thoughts about that in terms of, um, you know, how many monarchs to rear. And like you said, it's not really a conservation effort, but it seems to be like that's how it's been put out to the public to save the monarchs by re rearing them inside. Right, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, and I like your shirt. Um, I have, I saw that, or I learned about that study also through one of those webinars that I mentioned where they talked about four or five different studies relating to looking at reared monarchs versus, um, wild monarchs on a number of different ways. And so I don't, I haven't heard anything newer since then, but I did walk away. I remember walking away from that webinar thinking, oh, even when reared in captivity outside, but like contained in a container, there seem to be some differences between the reared monarchs and the wild cart monarchs. And I was like, wow. And I was kind of surprised by that because I thought, oh, maybe if they're under natural lighting and all of that, um, but, um, yeah, so I haven't heard anything more recently, um, but I definitely, I try to give the message of it's not a conservation strategy, <laughs> like, but, but some people just are really, um, feel really passionately about saving individual animals. Michelle, um, Larry's interested in milkweed bugs and their effect on populations. 
Yeah, so um, milkweed bugs are a natural other herbivore that eats milkweed plants. And milkweed plants have lots of interesting um, insects that eat them. And milkweed bugs are, are one of those. And so far as I know, there is not a conservation issue between monarchs and milkweed bugs. So maybe a plant, a milkweed plant that has lots of milkweed bugs on it might be less appealing for a monarch female to lay her eggs on. I don't know the answer to that, but I don't think there's any like big relationship between, oh, um, mon milkweed bugs are increasing and that's a cause of a loss of milkweed for monarchs. Um, they coexist on milkweed together. And there was a question here um, about the Baltimore checker spot, which is the state butterfly of Maryland. It is endangered. Its host plant is the turtle head plant, which is a wetland uh, plant and um, and wetland habitat decreases all over the all over. It decreases the population. I don't know, Michelle, if you want to say anything other, but you can plant it. Plant milkweed in your backyard. That's a great way to help the populations. Plant turtle head. Plant the plant the um, the host plants for these species, and that can really help boost the populations. Absolutely. So right, um, more than than like bringing monarchs you find inside, the better thing to do is increase their habitat outside. And so um, look for what milkweeds are native to where you are. You can look that kind of information up online. Not all of the native ones are gonna be available from a nur plant nursery or garden center, um, but there are several that are native to your area that you can find um, to plant. And um, I encourage you to plant them in a habitat with other flowering plants that would support the adult butterflies. So imagine like a natural monarch habitat is uh, a prairie, or an old field habitat that has a diversity of plants in it, including milkweeds, but also other flowering things. All right, I, I, I promised um, Calvin and Marianne I would give them a, 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 a platform just to talk about their projects with, that have to do with monarchs and teachers and schools. So Calvin, why don't you go first? Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention the Monarch Network teacher training. Um, I don't, I don't have their contact info so much. I will put their Facebook page in the chat. Um, but I took a training with them uh, about two years ago. Um, and they talk about how you can teach other people about monarchs, um, whether it's, you know, as a, as a teacher or just somebody in, in your neighborhood. So I'll put their information in there. And Marianne, you want to talk about the Monarch Sister Schools program? And you've mentioned that there's even, you take teachers down to Mexico in February, which sounds phenomenal. I want to go. Um, so why don't you tell us about your programs? Okay. So I would love to take you, Bronwyn, and I'm going to go for the first time next February because this February's trip was canceled due to COVID. So I'm hoping that the weather will be much better. Um, you know, next year, and uh, and we'll all be vaccinated, and it'll be safe to travel. Um, right now, Mexico was hit pretty hard with the COVID, you know, um, virus, and unfortunately, most of the students there don't have internet at home, so even virtual learning is difficult for them. Um, so our program is uh, was actually started to try to help restore the monarch's habitat. So we do encourage schools to plant gardens and to rear a few monarchs in each classroom so that they can understand the life cycle of the monarch and help save monarchs. Well, I think our generation has not done a good enough job at saving the monarchs, they keep declining. So we really need our young people to take on this cause and really champion it and get people to plant milkweed in their backyards and in parks and on roadways and especially in the Corn Belt where they're using too many pesticides. And this year I decided I would eat less meat when I found out that there is a, a lot of pesticide use so we can grow uh, corn and soybean to feed all the cattle. So I was like, I really do like a good steak and a good hamburger, but I'll, I'll cut back my use to twice a month instead of twice a week um, because I don't wanna support that, 
you know, habitat loss for the butterflies and other pollinators. So our, our program really, um, we're just promoting it mostly in schools, but we want everybody to plant milkweed. And we started the program also in Mexico with schools. So we are replacing the OML trees that are being taken out by illegal logging. And I mentioned in the chat box that another issue in Mexico is um, avocado farming, which there's a lot of research being done on it now. We think it might be cartel involvement with avocado farming. So I'm not buying any more avocados that come from Mexico. Um, you know, so there's lots of things we can do, little things, but the more we become aware of why the monarchs are declining, uh, I think is important. So I hope people will go to our website. They'll go and enjoy part of the International Monarch Festival that we started this year. And it will be celebrated every year um, the first weekend in March. We'll have International Monarch Festival between the United States, Canada, and Mexico. So most of the program this year is from Mexico because they've been doing this for seven years. So we moved it from a national festival in Mexico to an international festival to raise more awareness. Wonderful. Thank you, Marianne. And You're welcome. Would you want to put your email in the chat box if people want to contact you? You mentioned something about a, a, a list of, of plants that might... Oh, I just emailed you a list, the one without the pictures. But yeah, anybody who wants, I've got several, um, several lists that I can send out for the Chesapeake Bay region which is pretty large, but if you're anywhere else, you know, tuning in, you want to make sure you plant the native pollinators, uh, you know, plants and milkweeds uh, for your area. I only know of three milkweeds that we can plant here in butter in, in, in Baltimore or in Maryland, and that's the uh, common milkweed, the butterfly milkweed, and I forget the, the swamp milkweed, yeah, which I have the first two and I'm going to plant the third one uh, this year because I had a lot of areas this year with all the rain that got kind of uh, soggy in my backyard. So they're getting swamp milkweed. But I have milkweed in three areas in my backyard. And some of my neighbors are worried that the seeds are going to blow into their yard. But I've never had any plants grow from seed that, you know, have like the seeds have flown. They only grow by the roots underneath the grass and they'll come up every now and then. And I just pull those shoots out. So don't be afraid of planting milkweed. And there's a Mr. Lund science guy on YouTube that can teach you everything you need to know about growing milkweed, raising monarchs. I, I found his YouTubes and I've even learned a ton of stuff. I'm putting oh. my, uh, my uh, email in there now. Right. Well, Michelle, thank you so much for coming and sharing this. I think it's important to know that community science is science. Um, it's a way that you can be involved in real science and moving our, our collective knowledge base forward and understanding what's going on. I mean, if you look back in the presentation, reason why we know where butterflies, the monarchs go is because of community scientists out there. We are the eyes and the ears for the scientists that are in the labs, um, and it's an, such an important research, resource for them. The data, all data is, is, is important. Um, even the data where you have a patch that has no milkweed, it's all important. So please uh, make an effort to, if you are, are love monarchs and want to see them um, thrive for years and years to come, uh, get involved in one of the five programs that we presented here. Uh, look back, there are other ways that you can get involved in community science. Um, again, we focus on a different one each month and they are uh, can be accessed on our website. Next month is Submerged Aquatic Vegetation. Um, and we will make this presentation available via YouTube uh, tomorrow. Um, and again, if you have any other questions, feel free to send them to me. Michelle, did you put your email in there for people who wanted to contact well, you directly? Put it right now. And
And if you uh, like what we're doing, consider becoming one of our community curators by becoming a member of the Natural History Society of Maryland. And when this all is over, I want to see you all come in and visit us at our little museum in Baltimore. And if you are into butterflies and moths, consider joining our left club. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Thanks, Michelle, so much. You've been a, a wealth of information and, and, and encouragement for us. Well, thank you all for sharing all that you know, which is fantastic. And um, I definitely encourage you to get out there this spring and do any one of those projects. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Keep curious.